I want you to read with me here in John 20 verse 46. It was on the resurrection morning and the two of the disciples of Jesus, they got a message that Jesus arose from the dead. And both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. Say, he did not go in. Here's the thing. He ran, he outran Simon. He came to the grave first, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen clothes lying there. So we see here the two disciples. We see disciple John and we see disciple Simon. Got the message. Jesus has risen. And they ran to the grave, to the tomb. And John outran Peter. And he came there first. But he did not go in. But when Simon came there, he went in immediately. And he saw that Jesus was risen. The true Jesus will always confront us. Why? Do you know that there is another Jesus? The Bible teaches, the Apostle Paul says, that if somebody comes and preaches another Jesus, we must leave away. We must go away from those people. We must not accept that. Because Especially in the end times, there will be a gospel that is not a true gospel. There will be another Jesus preached that people will think it's the true Jesus. There is another Jesus. But let me say to you this morning, the true Jesus will always confront us. He will confront our lives. Can you say amen? amen. Why? Why will he confront us? Number one, he is our way maker. Say to somebody, he is our way maker. He's our way maker. And Jesus will confront us so that we will come to the understanding and the knowledge and the revelation that he is the only one that is our way maker. He is the only one that can take us forward. He is the only one that can bring us into the glory of God. Can you say amen? He's the only one. He's the way maker. There's nobody else. He'll confront us. I know when I was a, a youngster, my, my dad worked on construction. He built roads. In a sense, he was a way maker. So uh, on Saturdays, I would go with him, go and work with him. And be in the, he used to work in a grader, you know, a grader. And I would climb in the grader with him and see how he, you know, he worked. And later on, he, he gave me the controls. He even said, come on, you can do it. And he taught me how to, to work those controls. I was young. In holiday times, I would go with him. I would steer this thing. You know, it was, for me, that, that big, great, it had huge tires like that. And it had a lever, and you could get those tires, those wheels to flip over, and you can turn, you can turn sharp, you know, and then you can flip it over, lean it over as you want to turn. Great machine. But I learned that my dad was building roads. I learned and I saw how they would build roads where there were no roads. I saw that when we built down, when, when they built down in, in the low field, I saw how they, they made a road through the mountains, through rocky places. They used dynamite to blast through and make a road where there seemed to be no road. I learned something. When I came to know the Lord, I got to know him as the way maker. He is the way maker. He, the Bible says that he has gone out before us. The Lord goes out ahead of us. And you need to understand something here this morning. The Lord has already gone out before you. He has already gone to that place where he's taking you to. He's not saying to you, go there. I'll watch you. That's not so. He is saying to you, come and follow me. I'm taking you there. He's already been there. Amen. He's our way maker. He said to his disciples, 
I'm telling you the truth. In the house of my father, there are many mansions. I'm going to, to prepare a place for you. And once I've prepared a place for you, I will come and get you. I'll come and fetch you so that you can also be where I am. Why? Because he's the way maker. He is the one that makes a way for us right into the Holy of Holies. He has gone into the Holy of Holies for our sake so that we can go in through the blood of the Lamb. Can you say amen here this morning? We need to know Jesus as our way maker. We need to get to trust him as our, as our way maker. You see, this trust holds us back. Can you say amen? Unbelief can hold us back. Fear can hold us back. It can prevent us from going in, from getting to that place where He wants us to be. And many people are there right now where we are challenged, where we are confronted by things. We are confronted even by Jesus. The second reason why Jesus will always confront us is because He loves us. He loves us with a love that is, you know, it's indescribable. It's a love that is incomprehensible. Yeah, these are huge English words for me. I must be under the anointing. <laughs> Something for me. It's, it's difficult to understand. When I see Jesus and I see his love and I look at him at the cross, how he gave his life for me, how he was beaten, how he was, you know, he was humiliated. He was, he was, you know, he was just rejected by mankind. He was just, you know, bruised and he was, he suffered for me. And I remember where I was. I know where I came from. I know how sinful my life was. And I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm on my way. Can you say amen? I'm still in the process. I'm still under construction. But I know where I was. I mean, I was so deep, nobody could find me. Only Jesus could find me. If I tell you my sins, you'll run out. Say, Pastor, I don't want to hear that. Listen. I know how sinful, how lost I was. I was like in the deepest, deepest place. I was on the, like, on the, on the edge of hell. I remember one night, my wife and myself, we went dancing. In those days, Henley on Cliff was the place to dance. Uh, long before your time. Okay. It was the place to hang out, Pastor. Saturday nights. And I had, I had a brand new Opel Cadet. And I, let me come down. I think I, I just need to come down for a moment. Because I feel I'm speaking to somebody. I don't want to speak down on you. Because you need to know where I was. It doesn't matter where you are in your struggle, in your sin. Jesus loves you with a, a love that cannot even be understood. It cannot be explained. You know, I remember those days. I can tell you a story. I came out of a broken home. My father and mother got divorced when I was in the beginning of Standard 9, I think. And it devastated me. I was like, my heart was ripped apart. Because I had to choose between my mother and my father. It was terrible. When I went to the army, I was a good boy. I was a good boy. You know what I'm saying? In front of people, you know, I was a good boy. In school, you know, I was a good boy. And uh, I took good care of the daughters. I had four sisters. My dad was working. I saw him early in the morning when he went to work, and I went to meet him when he came back, nighttime. 
I had to take their daughters. Now, why am I telling you this? When I left house, when I left home, I went to army, and then I started drinking. I went right. My life started going down, the spiral down, down. All that pain, all that rejection, all that. I was like, I remember, Pastor, when my mother, one day when she left us, she called me in. And she said, she said, and I'm, I'm not speaking disrespectful. I love my mother. I respect her honor. I love my father. I respect, I respect them both. They were caught in sin. They were in the claws of the devil. Amen. And both of them, before they died, they came to Jesus. And I'm going to see them in heaven. Amen. My mother called me in. She said, I'm going to leave your dad. She was getting herself ready to leave. Can you hear me? And I started crying. I was, I was devastated. I started crying and said, no, you can't do that. I felt rejected. I felt, how can you do that? How can you, what about us? What about the children? My sisters, what about us? She said, no, she couldn't carry on. She was at that point in her life where she had to, she could, she had to get out of that situation where she was. Now, when I went to army, all these things got hold of me, and I went into alcohol, drinking. And then, when I started drinking, something happened. I felt much better. Until I know the, you know what I'm talking morning. about. And uh, they say when you drink, you go through some stages. You know, you first of all, you like you become very like a lion, or you know, become strong. You know, and then you become like a uh, peacock. Is that the right thing? Sort of foal, peacock. You brag, you know, and so on. But eventually, you end up like a pig. The more you get, is that the more you drink, you go through those stages. Now, some guys they can. They can drink a couple of drinks, you know, and stop there. Let's say that's fine. They'll just be like a lion, you know, just strong. But I couldn't stop there. I used to go on until I got to a peak. I became a, like a brawler. You know what a brawler is? I used to go to the bars and punch the guys, beat them up. My, my dad taught me to fight from a young, young age. Every Saturday, he would take me to my cousins, give us boxing gloves, started beating each other. They were older than I. He said, son, you must, you must stand your, your ground. You must fight them. I've got all the scars and things you will see. So this is what happened to me. And, you know, one night we were, I got married. Story, long story short. I was coming back from Helion Club, I was like, I, was, I had too many drinks. And I was driving and I couldn't make the corner here at the golf park. And I took one of those poles, hit one of those poles. I was like on the edge of hell. And there was a hand that came. It was a hand of Jesus. It just grabbed me. That love. If you don't know that love, I tell you, for me that is love. The love that can love a sinner. Only Jesus can love that way. That's why Jesus will confront us, because He loves us. He will not allow us to go astray. He will not allow us to turn away from Him. He will eventually, if we don't, if we just persist in that. But He loves us so much that He will keep on trying to pull us back to Him. Can you say Amen? amen. Sanctification is a process. It's not a once-off thing. Jesus already sanctified us. Can you say Amen? amen. You understand what I'm saying? But it's a process. It's like when you buy a car. When you buy that car, it's your car, but you still have to pay it off. So it's just like that in our lives. Jesus paid for us, but He's going to restore us. He's going to work in our lives every day. And He's not going to stop. Grace is not something cheap. Grace is something, it's powerful. It's the power of God working in us. Grace will meet us where we are, but grace will not leave us where, where we are. I cannot be longer that same man that did that 
you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. I can't be that same man because that power of grace transforms me. That power of grace set me free. The power of the blood of Jesus set me free. Jesus is a way maker out of that into the glory of God, into the fullness of God. Sometimes I get to that place where I'm facing something that's holding me back, my old life. May I hear the word says in Romans 6, But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. It says to me, it's a process. Can you say amen? Amen. It's a process. See, John outran Peter, but he did not go in. The question is, why not? What held him back? Why was he confronted? Hallelujah. I just sense that, uh, you know, Pastor Quivis is ministering completely differently to the first service. So, and we called you to the front. But there's some saints here, and I'm... I'm not just talking to the men. You've been serving the Lord for a long time and you're still like this. You can be married, but you're still lonely. You're still alone. You're still alone. You see, Peter and John didn't run alone. They were together. But I want to ask you a question this morning. Why was John the disciple whom Jesus loved? Why was he the one whom Jesus loved? What was different about John? That he could get to the place where he lay, as we can see on that photograph or that picture there, that he could lie on Jesus' chest. You see, the same thing happened as they were running because Jesus had died and they were running. Both of them running because Mary Magdalene had come and said, the tomb is empty. And here they're running and John outruns Peter and he gets and he stops in front. He stops and I want you to picture this big hole. It's, a, it's like a cave, there's a hole. There are so many stories that we can talk. There are so many levels that we can go in right now. Just there, each one of you is standing in front of that hole. And he stops and he can't go in. And we know that he loved Jesus. He was the disciple that Jesus loved. You know, there's, there was, a, there was a, a theologian once that spent his whole life studying the Gospel of John, and he came to the end of his life, and they asked him a question, and they said, so, you know, how do you think, do you think you know what's going on? And he said, I haven't even scratched the surface. Four Gospels, three synoptic, three plus minus the same, just a little, uh, you know, a different version, because they were talking about what Jesus did, why he did it, his acts. But then John comes, and he tells us about who he is. And if you go and look at the Gospels and you go and look at, uh, if you go and look at the epistles that he wrote, he never quoted scripture. <laughs> I'm sure you're glad to hear that this morning. He never quoted scripture. What did he do? He just focused on three things. I want you to believe that Jesus is, was fully man. I want you to believe that he is fully God. And I want you to believe that if you love him, you'll be obedient. It's all, the whole thing. I mean, think about it. He could say so many things. Luke, uh, Matthew, Mark, they said so many things. They quoted scripture. And all he said, and, and if you want to paraphrase John, 1 John, uh, uh, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, it's like this. You must love the Lord your God with your whole heart, with your whole mind, with all your strength. Yeah. And. This is not a one-horse race. If the love of Christ is in you, 
You cannot be alone anymore. You cannot go into that hole. You cannot go in until God puts you with somebody. You cannot walk this path. Up until now, you're lonely. No, no. There's got to be somebody in your life. There's got to be somebody that will go in first if there's doubt in your heart, if there's stuff that's holding you back. You need somebody. You cannot be. There's, there's a, a saying that says, no man is an island. Amen. No man is an island. And each one of us is standing in front of that hole today and asking ourselves, why aren't we going in? Because if we go in, great is the mystery of godliness. That's what the Bible says. There's enough in there. Remember, that hole is a, a birthplace. Amen. And we're a little bit different to Jesus because when he came out, he didn't come out with all the grave clothes. Amen. He came out. He folded everything. But we come out with all of that stuff. And that's, Pastor, why we need sanctification. Amen. Because when Lazarus, and it's funny that it's in John's gospel, when Lazarus came out, he couldn't even see. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's give the Lord a praise offering. Amen. Now, we remember that John wrote the book, inspired by the Holy Spirit. He's, he's the author of this book. So here in, in uh, verse 8, we read where he writes. He says, then the other disciple, he's, he's referring to himself. He says, then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. So John was actually saying that yeah, I got there and I looked in, you know, and the question is, why didn't he go in? Why didn't he go in? We see, we are, we are at a place now in the kingdom of God where many are not, they are there, they're not going in to the fullness. They're not going into resurrection life. Now, let me say to you, you cannot go. We cannot go into resurrection life unless we go into the death of Jesus first. Amen. We need to crucify our Ad Adam. We need to lay down our Adam. Can you say amen? amen? Some things need to die in our life, like fear and unbelief and doubt and jealousy and hatred and racism and all these kind of things needs to die. If we want to go into resurrection life, amen. we need to die. We need to, can I say, we need to let those things go. We need to put it to, into the cross, onto the cross. Amen. So John, maybe, you know, the Bible doesn't say, he says, I went in, I saw, I believed. So what he was saying is there was unbelief in my heart. Something was holding me back. He calls it unbelief. Fear is the same as unbelief. Maybe it was his Jewish tradition. His Jewish, you know, the Jews were not even allowed to touch a, a corpse. It was they had all these rituals. Maybe it was that. Or maybe he was, he was at that moment, he was, he was there. But, you know, he was, he was, there was doubt. What now? If I go in there and, and Jesus lies there. I know he said he was going to rise up, but did he really, did he really rise up from the dead? Something was holding him back. That doubt or fear or religion, whatever. But then came Peter. You see, John had passion. Say passion. passion. John had passion. He loved Jesus. He laid on his shoulder, on his breast. He had passion. He loved Jesus. But he left in faith. I believe that Peter was just one step ahead of him in this process of transformation. Peter was, you know, Peter, we know the story of Peter, how he was challenged right in the beginning to believe God, to go out into the deep end, cast out the nets. And then there was an amazing a miracle and then later he was challenged again to walk on the water and he stepped out in faith so maybe he was just this one level ahead one level higher in faith than John here's a good thing what Marcel just said that level of faith just took him into the tomb straight away and that faith pulled John in as well that's why we need each other we need each other. Amen. Jesus is the way maker. Simon realized that Jesus is the way maker. He realized he had a, a revelation 
that Jesus is the way maker. He, had, he saw too many miracles. He was at that point where he was, he was delivered from, from fear. He was delivered from, from, from these things that held him back. So he, he ran in. Even though John had a, probably had a greater passion, greater love for Jesus, Peter ran in ahead by his faith. So here in the book of Luke 13, we read Jesus saying, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Many who tries to get in through religion. They try to move in. But the religion cannot bring us in. Can you say amen? Religion cannot bring us into the promises of God. Our works cannot bring us into the promises of God. God is not so much interested in what we do for Him. He's much more interested in what we are. Here in Hebrews 3 verse 19 we read, So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. That was the first generation that went out of Egypt. They couldn't go into the promised land because of unbelief. Yet the Ark of the Covenant went out before them. The Ark of the Covenant is a type of Christ in the Old Testament. And the Ark of the Covenant was carried by the Levites. And when they stepped into the, into the uh, overflowing Jordan River, the river stopped flowing. And the ark stood there, and they could go through. Why? Because Jesus is the way maker, even through death. Can you say amen? He's the way maker. But we need to know him as the way maker that makes a way where there seems to be no way, even death. Passion is a great thing. Elijah had a burning passion. It's like a fire, Pastor. Well, you know, when Jesus comes into your life, it's like a fire burning inside of you. You know, and that passion needs to come under the yoke of Jesus. Hello, are you there? Who's got a great passion for Jesus? Come on, let me see your hands. Who's got a great passion for Jesus? But who knows that that passion needs to come under the yoke of Jesus? Because that you know, passion will make us cut off people's ears. I remember one morning we were, we were praying. And uh, I got so frustrated that um, I physically hit all of the guys in their chests. Like this. <laughs> and, uh, I, I ripped my shirt off. I don't know why I did that. I think that was still Neanderthal, you know, like the old man, you know. So I ripped my shirt off and then I, I climbed into each oak standing there. And there are guys that are sitting here that were there that morning. So I'm not even going to look at them because <laughs> they know who they are. But um, that was my passion, but it was not under the, under the yoke of, under Jesus. The yoke of Jesus Christ. That's exactly. Me. That's exactly. So what we need to do, well, let me just finish here. Elijah had a burning passion for God, but he almost got defeated by fear. Just think about that. He almost got defeated by fear. His faith level was not matching, was not matching his passion. To go in, we need faith that matches our passion. God wants our faith level to rise so that our passion and our faith, you, need, you see, you can, you can trust God. You have a passion can have a passion for God, for things of the Lord. But you need faith to break through. You need faith to go in. Passion will not bring you in. Not, passion alone will not bring you in. And I think many children of God feel frustrated because they've got passion, but they lack in faith to break through. Are you with me here this morning? It's your faith that makes you break through. So what I'm saying is we need passion and faith together. It's powerful when we have passion and faith together because then we'll move through. We'll go into the supernatural. Just remember now what happened after Pentecost. Peter and John, they were going to the, to the, uh, uh, up to the temple one morning and they were walking together. Just take my hand, hand Pastor. My hand. Okay. They were walking together, not like us now, but I'm just demonstrating something. Because something happened there in the tomb. They were knitted together. Their hearts were knitted together. They experienced resurrection life. And on the day of Pentecost, they received resurrection life, the power of the Holy Spirit. And they started going out in that power and strength of, of Holy Spirit. And there was a man sitting there. He was crippled. And they looked at him like this and said to him, silver and gold we have not. But what we have, we give it to you. Rise up and walk. They released that experience they had in the tomb. And the power of the Holy Spirit just flowed through them. And that man was instantly healed. Praise God. You see, you have to go in to experience resurrection life. You have to go in to experience miracle and breakthrough. 
Praise God. Amen. We do this, I'm closing now, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. It doesn't say here, you do this by keeping your eyes on Marcel. Amen. You do this by keeping your eyes on Pastor Kubus, or you're keeping your eyes on, on Pastor Garrett, or keeping your eyes on somebody else. It doesn't say your eyes must be on your brother or your sister. It says your eyes must be on Jesus. You go in by looking onto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. You're looking onto Jesus, the, the way maker. He's the one that makes the way. Amen. Your eyes are not on Jesus. You'll cut people's ears off. That's it. You'll fight with people all the way. You want people to help you through. People can't help you through. Only Jesus can. Amen. The Bible says Jesus is the initiator and the perfecter of our faith. 